Titanic was finished fitting out, and she sat at port with smoke billowing out of her smokestacks. Her crew was on board for the very first time, checking her over and familiarizing themselves with her. As the officials boarded, they looked out to sea, ready to stretch the ship's legs and see what she could do. Welcome to Fast Facts Friday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everyone, let's get into it. Recently, we did an episode on ship scrapping, which is something many ships go through. Another thing that almost all ships will endure are sea trials, so today we will look at the process. Ship building in of itself is a process, starting with the order for the ship. Once the order is placed, then the keel is laid. After this, she is built and floated out, which is the process that precedes the naming and launching. After this, she is launched, named, and christened, then undergoing the final building process, which is fitting out. Here, the final fittings are placed. And finally, she'll undergo sea trials before delivery and commissioning. A sea trial, trial trip, or shakedown cruise is the testing phase of a watercraft, and this includes but is not limited to boats, ships, and submarines. It is typically the last step in construction and takes place on open water, and it can last anywhere from a few hours to several days. In the Navy, these shakedown cruises can also be a great test run for the crew members themselves. That's cool and all, but why are we doing these sea trials? Well, they are conducted to measure a ship's performance and general seaworthiness. At this time, usually a ship's speed, maneuverability, equipment, and safety features are tested. For example, let's look at RMS Lusitania. During her sea trials, she was found to be incredibly fast, but uncomfortable shaking and vibrations were discovered that desperately needed to be addressed prior to her commissioning. To combat the vibrations from her steam turbines, extra columns and stabilizing elements were added to the interior of the ship to minimize vibrations felt by the passengers and bridge crew. Usually, technical representatives from the builder and from the builders of major systems, governing and certification officials, and representatives of the owners are all present during sea trials. For example, let's look at RMS Titanic sea trials and who was in attendance. At Titanic Sea Trials, there were 78 stokers, greasers, and firemen, and 41 members of the crew, as well as domestic representatives. These representatives were Thomas Andrews and Edward Wilding of Harland & Wolf, her builders, Harold A. Sanderson of the International Mercantile Marine Company, Francis Carruthers, a surveyor from the Board of Trade, and Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, her radio operators. Bruce Ismay and Lord Pyrie of White Star Line were supposed to attend, but were too sick at the time to make it. If I ever have the chance to attend one, I'll make sure to bring a camera. Sea trials are typically conducted on newly built ships, referred to as builder trials by the builders themselves. They are still regularly conducted on commissioned vessels as well, especially after refitting or refurbishing. For example, if we look at last week's episode, Haruna, she underwent several refits and refurbishments and had to undergo sea trials after some of these refits. In new ships, they are held to determine conformance to construction specifications. On commissioned vessels, they are generally used to confirm the impact of any modifications. In all cases, catching any problems or issues that need fixed is necessary. Sea trials can also refer to a short test trip undertaken by a prospective buyer of a new or used vessel as one determining factor in whether to purchase it. Think of it like taking a car out for a test drive. You take it on the highway, back roads, and main roads. You pump the brakes, you check to make sure the transmission shifts nicely, and you look for any visible issues. In some cases, you can take a car on a test drive to your mechanic and they will give it a once over to make sure you're not buying what my mama would call a money pit, which is just a car you pour tons of cash into and it spends more time in the mechanic's driveway than yours. Sea trials can be used for the same reason, giving buyers the confidence they need to invest in a new vessel. Now that we know the generics, we can get down into the nitty gritty. If you are enjoying this episode and want to hear more about ships, their careers, and their wrecks, check out our main show, Shipwreck Sunday, every Sunday night at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Okay, let's get into the specifics. Sea trials are pretty standardized using technical bulletins published by the International Towing Tank Conference, the Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, British Maritime Technology, regulatory agencies, or the owners. They involve demonstrations and tests of the ship's systems and performance. Let's look at some of the aspects of these trials. First, let's look at a speed trial. 
During a speed trial, the ship is ballasted or loaded to a predetermined draft, and the propulsion machinery is set to the contracted maximum service setting, usually some percentage of the machinery's maximum continuous rating. The ship's heading is adjusted to have the wind and tide as close to bow on as possible. The ship is allowed to come to speed, and the speed is continuously recorded using differential GPS. The trial will be executed with different speeds, including service or designed, and maximum speed. The ship is then turned through 180 degrees, and the procedure is followed again. This reduces the impact of wind and tide. The final trial speed is determined by averaging all of the measured speeds during each of the runs. This process may be repeated in various sea states. Next is the crash stop. To test a crash stop, the ship is ballasted or loaded to a predetermined draft, and the propulsion machinery is set to the contracted maximum service setting again. The trial begins once the order to execute crash stop is given. At this point, the propulsion machinery is set to full astern, and the helm is put hard over to either port or starboard. The speed, position, and heading are continuously recorded using differential GPS. The final time to stop track line, meaning the ship reaches a speed of zero knots, the ship's drift, which is the distance traveled perpendicular to the original course, and the ship's advance, which is the distance traveled along the original course line, are all calculated. The trial may be repeated at various starting speeds. Next, we test for endurance. Again, the ship is ballasted or loaded to a predetermined draft, and the propulsion machinery is set to the contracted maximum service setting. At this point, the fuel flow, exhaust, and cooling water temperatures and ship speed are all recorded and monitored. After this, we get into maneuvering trials. These involve a number of trials to determine the maneuverability and directional stability of the ship. These include a direct and reverse spiral maneuver, zigzag, and lateral thruster use. And finally, we need to look at sea keeping. Sea keeping, by definition, for those that are unfamiliar with the term, is the ability of a vessel to withstand rough conditions at sea. These trials were originally used exclusively for passenger ships, but are now used in a variety of ships. They involve measurements of ship motions in various sea states, followed by a series of analyses to determine comfort levels, likelihood of seasickness, and hull damage. Trials are usually protracted in nature due to the unpredictability of finding the correct sea state, and the need to conduct the trials at various headings and speeds. All in all, sea trials are an important and necessary part of the shipbuilding process, and it ensures all vessels are safe and ready for their time at sea. Without sea trials, critical errors could be missed, and a ship's capabilities may never be realized. The ocean liner had been through so much in her life cycle, and it changed hands numerous times. Once a ship of the Weimar Republic, she moved into Russia in the late 1940s and worked for the Soviet Union. As she left the busy port, no one suspected the disaster that lay ahead, and heading straight toward her was an intimidating bulk carrier. In this week's episode of Shipwreck Sunday, we get into the tragedy surrounding SS Admiral Nakamov. 